As of today, we are officially 19 days until the start of the 2020 to 2021 NBA season. For teams that went on deep playoff runs in the bubble, this will be the shortest offseason in recent memory. Then there are teams, other teams that did not meet the requirements to enter the NBA bubble. So they haven't played meaningful organized NBA basketball since March. During this shortened season, the NBA draft and the start of free agency happened within two days of each other. And during that span of time, trades were being formally agreed upon and conducted. So it feels like the makeup of teams throughout the league seemingly shifted overnight. Throughout the month of December, I will be previewing every NBA team before the first games on December 22nd, meaning I will be posting every day until the season kicks off. 30 teams in 21 days, the preseason preview series. And the next team up is the Los Angeles Lakers. Last season, my LA Lakers went 52-19, and putting them at first in the Western Conference, and in the end, they won the NBA championship. Don't say it was a Disneyland trophy or whatever, it's an NBA championship, and when we look back on it, it's the most unique NBA championship in NBA history, so don't talk shit to me in the comments. Their top performers were LeBron James and Anthony Davis, and their more interesting players from last year were Kyle Kuzma, Alex Caruso, and Taylor Horton Tucker. LeBron James put up about 25 points per game, 10 assists, got 8 rebounds on 49% from the field and 35% from 3. It seems like we ask this question every single year, was this LeBron James last year of being a top 3 player in the league, last year of being the best player in the league, is he finally out of his prime? And I'm just going to stop making predictions about it because there's been years that I've said he's out of his prime and I was just... I couldn't be as far from being wrong as I was because he'll just come back and put up numbers like these. But I do think LeBron will start to defer to Anthony Davis even more than he did last year because, yes, last year Anthony Davis did lead the Lakers in scoring, as we'll talk about, but, I mean, LeBron James was right there behind him. I think this upcoming year, LeBron will definitely want to defer to Anthony Davis a bit with LeBron being a year older and with the Lakers just winning a championship and having to play meaningful NBA basketball in the span of, what, two months? So LeBron being older and always cognizant of managing his fatigue, he'll definitely defer more to Anthony Davis this season, even more than he did so last year. Anthony Davis averaged about 26 points per game, about 9 rebounds, got about 2 blocks per game, and about 1.5 steals per game. He shot 50% from the field and 33% from 3. As of today, I don't even know if Anthony Davis signed an extension. Um, maybe I just assumed that he did so and just stopped paying attention, but maybe he hasn't done so yet? I remember there was a rumor about him waiting to see what Giannis was going to do, but... I don't know, this whole thing is weird. Like, do we have Anthony Davis or not? Regardless, we're talking about his last season performance and he was a beast last year. I mean, he's always been a beast throughout his entire tenure in the NBA, but now that he's playing on a team that actually has talent around him that actually can go far in the playoffs, and the NBA world finally took notice of the talent that this guy has. In my opinion, he should have won Defensive Player of the Year. I think he's more of an impactful defender on the floor than Giannis is. And not just because he averaged more blocks and averaged more steals, but I mean, just the eye test tells me that. Yeah, the Lakers had two players who were all NBA first team last year, and these are definitely two players that are top six in the entire league, in my opinion. I mean, you can take my opinion with a grain of salt because I am a Laker fan, so I'm trying to be as unbiased as possible. Kyle Kuzma. Oh, man. This is a love-hate relationship for all Laker fans regarding Kyle Kuzma. Unless you're a girl that is also a Laker fan because girls just love this guy. But Kyle Kuzma put up about 13 points per game, 4.5 rebounds rather inefficiently on about 43 or 44% from the field and 31 or 32% from 3 on about 4.5 attempts per game. Kyle Kuzma showed a lot of promise in his rookie year when he was playing on those bummy Laker teams, especially with his ability to play off ball and actually hit a 3-point shot because early in his Laker days when it was just him, Lonzo, Brandon Ingram. Brandon Ingram didn't really have the three-point shot that he has right now, and Kuzma was the guy who had the three-point shot and, and was hitting it at a high rate on a high clip. But ever since LeBron showed up, it's like how Kuzma just cannot buy a three-point shot anymore. And this was the main reason that Magic Johnson, or not Magic Johnson, 
who made that trade? No, it was Rob Polinka because Johnson was out of there. This was the main reason that Rob Polinka wanted to make sure they didn't give up Kuzma, along with all of the other young Lakers that they gave up for Anthony Davis because they thought Kuzma was the guy that could definitely play off ball with Anthony Davis and LeBron James. You're going to want another player, a third, a possibly third scoring option who's consistent that can definitely score off the ball because of his three point shot. They thought Kuzma could be that. And he simply hasn't been able to because his three-point shot has just been very, very lacking. Alex Caruso, he's a player everybody loves because he's the GOAT. But if you're a Laker fan and you watch every single game, you know Caruso's impact on the floor is not felt in his stats. It's not felt in his baldness. It's felt just on the eye test and the amount of energy that he brings to the team whenever he steps on the floor. He's a spark plug for the team. He's instant energy. He's tough, rugged, hard nose on the defensive end, and it shows in his per 100 steal numbers. He averages 2.8 steals per 100. Caruso is a very disruptive defender, whether it's in passing lanes, whether it's getting some on-ball steals from time to time, or getting some help side defensive blocks. Caruso is just a very disruptive defender. These disruptions are what allow the Lakers to really run in the fast break from time to time because a lot of their points came in the fast break they were using defense translating it to offense via disruptions anthony davis blocks javel mcgee blocks dwight howard blocks steals from alex caruso and everybody else on the perimeter this was a primary source of offense for the lakers points off turnovers and caruso was a big part of that the lakers had a 5.3 better defensive rating with caruso on the floor in the regular season and in the playoffs the Lakers had a 7.4 better defensive rating with Caruso on the floor, so that just goes to show his defensive impact. Taylor Horton Tucker was the lone first round pick from the Lakers in the 2029, 2029, in the 2019 draft. He's a player who came into the league with defensive potential. I don't think he had that much uh, offensive game that was really being heralded. But he came in as somebody who could be a tough, rugged, on-ball defender. Um, I didn't really get to see that throughout the regular season because he didn't get that much time. But we'll see if he gets some more playing time in this season. Now we get to the offseason, the point of the video where everybody was waiting for. Off-season adjustments, trades. The Lakers get Dennis Schroeder and they give away Danny Green, um, a player who was hated by many Laker fans for no, I'm not going to say for no reason because he was very inconsistent from three, but I mean the amount of hate that he was getting was really undeserved. Kind of made me feel bad for him. Nobody deserves to get death threats in the playoffs. But um, they got Dennis Schroeder by giving away Danny Green and I don't know if it was a couple of second round picks or one of the few first round picks that the Lakers have. I can't remember. But they got Dennis fucking Schroeder. Now this is somebody who can definitely be a consistent third scoring option. Dennis Schroeder, this man should have won sixth man of the year last year in my opinion. But regardless, this man is a bona fide bucket. He got like 18 points per game last year and his efficiency improved. He wasn't always a good three point shooter in his career, especially in his Atlanta days but he has continued to improve as he's been in Oklahoma City. I think he shot above 36% from three. Let me just check that really quick. Yeah, Dennis Schroeder shot 38.5% from three-point land on five attempts per game, and he scored 19 points per game. So yeah, this is definitely somebody who can be a consistent third scoring option for the Lakers, and he's only 26 or 27 years old, so he's somebody who's smack dead in the middle of his prime. Along with uh, Anthony Davis, he can kind of be somebody who plays with Anthony Davis while he's in LA. But yeah, the pickup of Dennis Schroeder was a great pickup for the Lakers, getting somebody who definitely can be a consistent third scoring option, and they really didn't give up that much. In terms of draftees, the Lakers did not have a first round pick. I don't even think they had a pick at all. But in terms of free agency signings, the Lakers were active on this front as well. They signed Marcus on a two year, I think, veterans minimum type of contract. They re signed. KCP on a three-year $40 million per year contract. They signed Markeith Morris. I don't know the details of that contract. And they signed Montrez Harold. I honestly think this is more unexpected than the Gordon Hayward signing because 
He's literally bouncing from the other LA team and he's signing on a veteran minimum contract uh, for two years with a team option on the second year. I've been kind of monitoring this storyline to see why the hell Montrez Hero wants to leave the Clippers and it just seemed like from his perspective he said the Clippers made him feel like he was unwanted. So this dude snaked he snaked the fuck out of them and went to the Lakers. So that's another guy who can be a consistent third or fourth scoring option. I guess the rich just just literally get richer. And I'm also surprised that he didn't get a big time offer from anybody else in free agency. Uh, Montrez Harrell, I think throughout his career, I don't think he's had a contract where he was making more than, what, $10 million per year annually? So he's never really made that much money. And you would think that coming off a sixth man of the year award winning year, this would be the year for him to cash out and get that big time deal from somebody in the free agency market and i guess that deal just did not come into fruition and he decided to sign a two-year 18 million or basically 19 million dollar contract and it's not a team option for the second year it's a player option for the second year i'm guessing Montres signed this contract to really prove his value again in the 2021 offseason where more teams will be saving their money for marquee free agents not that Montrez Harrell is going to be one of the more premier uh free agents on the market but he's still going to be one of the better ones I don't know it's just interesting because I definitely expected him to get like a four year 70 million dollar contract from some desperate team who maybe was trash and just needed a center and I honestly thought that team was going to be the Hornets because we know they need a center for the future um but they gave that money to Gordon Hayward but hey I'm not going to complain I'm a Laker fan we got the sixth man of the year and the player that I think should have won sixth man of the year after coming off a year where the lakers struggles was or from the media everybody was talking about oh who's going to be the third scoring option when in reality that third scoring option fluctuated from game to game from week to week from series to series some games it was kcp going off from three and slashing to the rim some days it was kyle kuzma who was actually on some days it was rondo more often than not it was playoff rondo um some nights danny green went off from three and so that third scoring option fluctuated from game to game and it was a formula that worked for the lakers to win them a championship so it's not like the lakers really even needed a third consistent scoring option to win the championship but they were able to add two more consistent scoring options in free agency and through the trade with Dennis Schroeder and through obviously through free agency with Montrez Harrell. Um, I think Montrez Harrell will still come off the bench even though the Lakers did not bring back Dwight Howard and JaVale McGee is going to the Cavaliers. I think he's still going to be our bench center and I think the Lakers are going to start Marc Gasol to kind of keep that defensive center, that big body defensive center rim protecting next to AD because that was the formula that worked for the Lakers throughout the regular season. The KCP signing is cool, I guess. I mean, he really improved last year. Compared to his playing level before last year, um, last year he really proved his value. He was Loki might have been the best shooter on the team. So yeah, I, I'm kind of fine with KCP resigning um, and Marcus, not Marcus, Markeith Morris resigning is cool, I guess. Looking at the personnel for this team as of right now, the guard depth is Dennis Schroeder, KCP, Alex Caruso, and Wesley Matthews. Oh, I didn't even talk about them signing Wesley Matthews. Another 3 and D wing you hope can still shoot the ball. I mean, Wesley Matthews hasn't really shot the ball as well as he shot it in Portland early in his career, but he's always somebody that, you know, is a threat from out there, so that's a good signing. Anyway, at the forward positions, they have LeBron, AD, Kuzma, and Markeith, and at the center positions, they have Gasol and Montrez Harrell. Coaching them is Frank Vogel. Um, coming into the season, I didn't really know what to make of it because it was kind of a while since he coached that successful Indiana Pacers defensive juggernaut of a team that pushed LeBron James and the Heat to like seven games so I didn't really know if he still had you know that that touch on defense but I was wrong and the Lakers were one of the better I think they were the best defensive team in the league maybe they're a top three so credit to Frank Vogel I think he's established himself back to being in the top third in the league in terms of coaches um but we'll see what he does for the remainder of his stint in Los Angeles so now the projected starting lineup for this team, I thought about this one a lot. I think they're going to start Dennis Schroeder at point guard and I think they're going to bench, not bench, but you know, 
bring Montrezl Harrell off the bench um, and have their starting lineup be Dennis Schroeder at point, ACP at the two guard, LeBron at small forward, Davis running power forward, and Gasol running center. Like I said, I think they're going to keep Gasol running center to have that big body center next to Davis because Davis does not like to play the center for an entire NBA season. And I think they bring in Dennis Schroeder to the starting lineup to really be that third consistent scoring option. Estimating their record, I think they'll be 54 and 18 um, over a 72 game season. I think they'll still get 50 wins. And I think they'll be first in the Western Conference. I mean, they were first last year and they didn't have Montrez Harrell and Dennis Schroeder on the team. Uh, I, am I biased for saying that I think they'll be first this year after bringing in two players who were top two and six man of the year voting? I guess I'm being biased by saying I think they're going to win the championship again because they won the championship last year without Dennis Schroeder and Montrezl Harrell, without two players who were basically averaging 19 points per game last year, and they're bringing that in. This is a championship team that managed to get better. Rob Pelinka and the Lakers found a way to get even better after winning the chip. I credit them for not being complacent. They felt the need to get better with teams like the Nuggets and Mavs getting older and better in the West, and with the Clippers being a hungry, desperate team in the same arena. Not only did adversaries improve in the West, but also out East. The Nets and 76ers are teams with high-end talent that also got a lot healthier will definitely be forces to be reckoned with. And also the same formidable contenders remain, the Bucks, the Raptors, Celtics, and Heat. And with the Bucks adding Drew Holiday, most would say that they improved as a team even with boasting the best regular season record last year. However, in my opinion, LA's offseason adjustments should position the purple and gold as favorites to repeat as champions in 2021. There's no way that this is real man, it can't be.